Aloha, good morning and welcome to Community Matters. My name is Stacy Hayashi and I'm actually filling in for Jay Fidel this morning. Um, today on the show we have Sean Martin, who is the president of the Hawaii Longline Association, and Davey Tano, who is a fisheries management consultant. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, good morning, Stacy. Um, so there's been something in the news, all over the news, actually. Mm -hmm. Can you tell our viewers what it is? <laughs> Well, I think, I think just to start it off, I think that um, several months ago there was a, a request by a group of, of Hawaiians, I think, um, and the request was to the president uh, of the U.S. to uh, expand the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine Monument um, from its current uh, uh, size to an increase of some 350%. Um, and the kind of the real issue from an industry perspective and a fishing industry perspective is that is that these are important waters to the Hawaii-based uh, longline fishery in particular, but, but um, that's not exclusive. There's other fisheries um, in, in the state who also access these waters and potentially will lose, lose the opportunity to access these waters. Um, opportunistically as uh, the fish kind of migrate around the state of Hawaii. So it's a, it's a very important issue for us uh, uh, in the commercial fishing industry here in Hawaii. And, and um, um, so we've, we've been working to try to educate people as to what it may mean w if the expansion is, is uh, uh, authorized by the president. Right, of course, um, because, you know, an island state, Hawaii, of course, depends heavily, right, on fish, mm -hmm. um, culturally. Um, uh, Dave, can you tell us a little bit about your background and where, you, where you're coming from? Sure. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, I'll correct you a little bit when you introduced me. Uh, you introduced me as a management specialist. I'm, oh, I'm not a geez. management. I'm really more <laughs> in research. I've been involved in um, tuna-specific research for 30 years in the Western Pacific and uh, also collaborate with the Indian Ocean and uh, the Atlantic in some issues. So my background, if that's what you want, is has been based in Western Pacific fisheries research. I um, did a lot of work with the uh, South Pacific Commission out of New Caledonia, and they're now the service provider for the Western and Central Pacific Fishery Commission. That's the commission that um, handles um, all of the area from just east of Hawaii all the way to the Asian mainland uh, in management and it's supported by research scientists like myself. Um, I was a long time with the University of Hawaii. We had a, a specific program called the Pelagic Fishery Research Program conducting management oriented research that is answering questions for management. Um, then I was working with NOAA, NOAA Fisheries here in Honolulu, and now I'm a private consultant doing um, mainly pelagic fisheries research uh, projects for the region. And I'm on the scientific and statistical committee for the uh, Western, uh, Pacific, Re Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council, that's the U.S. Oh, Council. Right. Yeah, so we provide um, scientific advice to the, um, the members of the to commission. The Council. Yeah. Got it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Cool. So actually, well, here's a question for you, being a scientist. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the ahi stocks. Are they? Are we overfishing our ahi? I know a lot of. I hear a lot of this out there. Is that true? Well, when you say ahi, that brings in usually two two fish: the yellowfin tuna and the blue f big. Sorry, big eye tuna. And our fleet depends on big eye tuna, and. Uh, that's assessed all the way for, for, within that vast commission. We have a stock assessment that includes areas from east of Hawaii all the way to the Asian mainland. And that stock, if considered as a whole, is in, um, there is overfishing occurring on that stock. And, and there's, um, so th that, that's brought about a quota to our fleet. So longline fisheries all in that region are under annual quotas. And the per seine fisheries, the large fisheries, um, are managed by reducing the days that they can fish on fish aggregating devices, which tend to um, collect the more the juvenile sized fish. So there's two issues the juvenile fish and then the adult stock. 
but within our fishery, we don't really see a decline in catch rates. In fact, catch rates have been improving. Mm. Um, the average size of fish has been steady for a long, long time. So um, fishing has actually been good. So there's probably some partitioning of that stock within this vast region of the Pacific um, that's not being specifically addressed by that stock assessment. But um, so technically there is overfishing occurring um, according to the broad stock assessment. We, we don't see it in our region per se. Uh, um, so we're trying to get a more regional look at, at what's going on. But so that's a long, <laughs> long <laughs> explanation to say that, that technically we're um, under a rebuilding plan for Big Eye under the Western Pacific, but um, fishing is good mm. for our fleet. So we're not wiping out our fish stock. Apparently not. Right, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So Sean, maybe you can explain a little bit about long lining um, uh, versus the per sign net that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well long line fishing is actually described as just what it just what the name of it is so so um, the longline fishery is a fishery where a boat um, deploys a, 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 a static line in the ocean and clips on a number of hooks on that line and that line drifts around the ocean during the day uh, mostly and uh, and then in the evening it's retrieved so um, longline fishing is is well known as being a, um, a high-valued, low-volume fishery. So the ahi that we enjoy uh, uh, for our sashimi and, and pokey um, oftentimes comes from the longline fishery, which produces a high-valued um, high valued product that is very much in demand here in the state of Hawaii. So um, contrary to, to the longline fishery, the Persane fishery is a fishery that um, really doesn't take place near Hawaii at all. Um, it does take place mostly within the uh, equatorial 10 north, 10 south of the equator area, um, both east and west from, from, from where Hawaii would be. And that's a fishery that targets skipjack um, in, in very large volume. So it's not, uh, these, are, these are boats that are 250 to 300 feet long that, um, that have the capacity to hold uh, uh, up to 1,500 metric tons of fish at one time and one trip. How, bi how big are our boats? Our boats, the, by regulation, our biggest boat is 100 feet. Um, and the average boat size here in the Hawaii fishery is about uh, probably around 75 feet, 78 feet, something like that. So relatively small boats. And, and, and although these boats are, are, are relatively small, they range um, in our fishery within 1,000 miles of, of the island of Oahu. So they're, they're capable of, of, um, of moving around the ocean and, and hopefully going where the fish are. Um, that's the idea anyway. It doesn't always work out. <laughs> Fishing is uh, fishing, right? Yeah, <laughs> yep. As I heard at the They don't fish call option. it catching. <laughs> yeah. So these boats, um, they go out and they stay out for how yeah, long? A typical, a typical trip is, uh, is about uh, 22 or 23 days. So of that nice. 22 or 23 days, <laughs> they, might, uh, they might fish 13 or 14. So the rest is, is travel. Um, and it could be in any direction from, uh, from Oahu. And so to put that in perspective, uh, if you were to go west uh, within the range, um, you might be out very close to Midway Island, which is about uh, 1,300 miles west of here. If you went south, uh, Palmyra Island is uh, 960 miles south of here. Um, if you went to the east or northeast, halfway to the mainland. And so that's the range of, range of the fishery. And, and really, we never know which way we're going to have to go to find the fish. So um, it, it truly, and if we went straight north, we'd be halfway to Alaska. So it's a very broad ranging fishery. Um, and certain times of year um, or certain years, fish tend to be in different areas. And, and so maybe, maybe you might go west this year and you might go east next year. Um, so, so, but that's kind of how the fishery, how the fishery uh, uh, works. Could I add something to that? Just that um, it sounds like a, a like a long trips to a lot of people and and whatnot. But 
in the perspective of the broader fishery, our fishery is actually fairly short range and short duration because the fish are held on ice only. It's a fresh, kind of unique, it's a fresh fish fishery. There's no freezing going on on, boat, on, on board. Mm. Like a lot it's of the- not frozen. From yeah, it. not frozen. It's, they're it's they're kept um, fresh on ice, very high quality, and brought back in that fresh condition. And so the trips are limited in length for, to accommodate that, that freshness. And I just mentioned that because um, the range of the smaller vessels in our fleet is not so great. And therefore, um, any, any restriction on where they can fish does impact them. Some of the foreign fleets, they super freeze, what they call, they freeze their catch so cold that they can maintain it for a year at sea if you want. Ew. And, <laughs> but it's in high quality and Ew. people don't realize that it's frozen so cold that it's mm. thawed out in sashimi grade it can be done like eight months later. Wow. It's still well, there's our that. fish auction right there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, these are fresh fish only on ice. And so they have a, a timer as soon as you cook them, I would catch them. They, there's a timer that starts on them that they have to be marketed within a certain amount of time. Hmm. And so how many boats do we have in our fleet? Um, there's about 142 active boats in the fishery um, that are based out of Honolulu. The entire fleet is based here. Um, virtually all of the fish that, that is landed by that fleet is, is landed at the local fish auction uh, for distribution, uh, primarily here in the state of Hawaii. Um, so these are our local fish. These are the, this is what you're what you're finding in uh, in the in the store or in the market or in the restaurant here. It is it is local and and most of it stays in the state. That's reassuring because I think you know a lot of people, even restaurateurs, some of them don't know where the fish comes from. They think mm -hmm. it's foreign. So mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know some of it is, but mm -hmm. um, our ahi is local. Right. right? Um, hmm. I don't know if we're supposed to go to a commercial. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we're supposed to, we're going to go to a commercial. Okay, um, we have one commercial break, and we will be back with uh, more. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on ThinkTechHawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host. Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. would like to mention, I'm sure that... Uh, welcome back to Community Matters. Today we're here talking to Sean Martin, president of the Hawaii Long Line Association, and Davey Tano, who is a fish scientist, <laughs> right? The fish researcher. Um, and we're talking about the expansion of the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Papahonua Mokuakea. Close. I, pretty, pretty close. <laughs> Papahonua we'll, we'll Mokuakea? Yeah. Oh my gosh, go. it's so long. Um, anyway, the monument. And so currently it's a radius of 50 miles, correct? Established in 2006. Well, it's actually a little bit different than that. Yeah. Uh, Hawaii, is, Hawaii is very unique because um, when they talk about a 50-mile closure, they're talking about 50 miles from a, a point like of emergent radius, land. Right? And so in the case of Hawaii, when you start talking about a 50-mile closure, it's really a 100-mile closure because um, we're talking about around an island. So currently the monument, it, just to put it in perspective, is, is 100 miles wide and 1,400 oh, miles long. Here we go. And, right, um, so that existing monument is the little, the pinkish area. So lighter correct? colored, yeah. lighter colored shading is and the existing monument, which was actually um, um, put in place by the Fishery Council back in uh, in the 90s. 
as a prohibited area for longline fishing in that mm. in that area. So it's an existing thing that was actually um, done through a public process and and and. Um, uh, primarily to minimize impacts on some protected species, the lion monk seal, which we all know and love, mm -hmm. um, as well as some other species up uh, in that sensitive area. Um, and so that's a long established uh, uh, closed area, 100 miles wide, 1400 miles. This looks miles like wide. a huge area of closure mm -hmm. <laughs> to me. Um, what, what is this going to do to the everyday person living in Hawaii, or not even living in Hawaii, with the tourist coming in? Well, I, I think that, that it, will, um, it will impact the resources that, that the Hawaii fishery um, produces for the people here of Hawaii, as, as well as, uh, you know, the visitor industry, which, of course, is a very important component uh, of our, of our uh, market. And so if you, if you expand the monument from 140,000 square miles, which what the existing monument is, um, out to some 500,000 square miles, so a 400 mile wide swath, 1,400 miles long. It, it's, it's really, it's unprecedented. And, um, and that area is a very important uh, area for the fishery. Um, and it's, uh, it's affected by oceanographic conditions, seasons, weather, um, those kind of things. But we do spend a significant amount of time in areas that would be uh, closed should the monument expansion uh, uh, move forward. Uh, so what's this going to do to you as a fisherman? Well, it's, it's going to make us less efficient, um, and we're, we would have to redirect our, our efforts to other places, um, which may at certain times be less, uh, less uh, uh, productive than, than what we currently do, and it, and it, and it restricts our, our opportunity. Um, it, and so if we, if that area that we're looking at there is, is, uh, is off limits, you of course consolidate the energies of the fishery in other places, which has, uh, you can make an argument that, that that's not a good thing either to, to, to actually consolidate um, into, by regulation. Where, where boats can fish, it, it, it takes away opportunities that, that um, may be very important to us at times. Wouldn't it require your boats to go farther? Isn't that kind of dangerous? Well, we're in a dangerous business. Uh, um, <laughs> and using an example, last year we had several hurricanes that, that, that transited the area, most, mostly um, northeast of the islands. And, and um, because of some other regulations, some quota regulations, um, boats had to transit that path of hurricanes. And, and it, was, it was actually a very uncomfortable uh, period of time to be operating because we had to transit an area of, of, um, of a high probability of, of getting into some bad weather um, to get to some areas that, that, that were productive. Um, and that was the only area at that time that we had to fish in. So, hmm. so it, 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 there's a lot of things that weigh into, into a proposed expansion that, that aren't necessarily good for the industry or for the resource. What about the environment? So, Dave, you're a scientist. Would this okay. help? Well, that's as a scientist in the scientific community that um, that I'm representing. The particular issue here that we take um, take offense to is that this expansion is being touted as as for scientific purposes and being defensible as far as increasing protections. But um, basically, the 50 mile buffer zone, 100 miles around all those islands, was put in place to protect monk seals, turtles, birds, and it does that adequately. And the expansion of another 150 miles outside those boundaries, out to 200 miles, is basically being done for political reasons and not for scientific reasons. There's not going to be a great deal of additional protection to those resources, and everyone wants to protect those resources. There's no doubt about that the fishermen and, and on all sides. But we feel that, that they're adequately protected with the existing um, monument boundary. So by pushing it out to 200 miles, it's really ironic because the 200 mile limit was put in place to provide exclusive economic benefits to American citizens, fishermen. And right. now we're being and Hawaii is part of America, right? Now, <laughs> yes, and now now they're talking about um, restricting Americans from that very zone. That's we, crazy. We fought, we fought hard to get. 
back in the days when strange. the Soviets and the Japanese were in Alaska, right off the beach. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's an issue. And the other issue is that, as Sean mentioned, the more disadvantage that we provide to our U.S. flag fishermen, that's giving a direct advantage to the foreign fleets. And where is that fish going to come from that we can't catch locally? It'll be made up with imports. And where do those imports come from? They come from fisheries that are not well regulated. And certainly not as well regulated as the U.S. fleet. Right. Because we have all these restrictions and, um, and there's um, safeguards. And monitoring too, right? Yeah. Tremendous observer monitors. coverage, monitoring, uh, a very clean fishery so that the fish that we eat from our U.S. fishermen comes at a, um, at a well-monitored um, pace and as opposed to some of the foreign fleets that we can buy imports from various fleets, but they, that those fish were taken at a high ecological cost, we call that, yeah, compared to what our so those were manage. the rapers and pillagers of the planet. <laughs> well, you, you can use any words you wish to. <laughs> Not <laughs> You want to, but um, the fish that comes from other fleets will come at a higher cost to the environment. Doesn't it seem that we're punishing the wrong people? It certainly does. It feels like it, huh? It certainly does. I, and think, that, I think that one of the, one of the things that, that, that people need to recognize is that, that our fishery, as I described earlier in the range of our fishery, we're fishing side by side with, with foreign fleets. Um, foreign fleets don't have access to Hawaii markets by landing within the state, but they do have access to Hawaii markets um, through the airport. So one of the, one of the things that I would like people to think about is, would you rather get your fish from a U.S. managed fishery and highly regarded um, uh, in the international community as being a well-managed fishery, or would you rather go to the airport and, and, and get your fish that way? And, and we would hope that people recognize that, that a well-managed fishery should be rewarded with, with uh, uh, opportunities to continue to, to, to operate viably rather than not having to think about it, go to the airport, get your fish. And, and sometimes people don't recognize or, or acknowledge where their fish really comes from, um, whether it comes from a local uh, U.S. fishery or if it comes from a, a, f from a foreign fishery that maybe doesn't operate under the tight constraints that, uh, that we've been operating under for really for 20 years um, through some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the management measures that have been put in place um, by the Fishery Management Council that are recognized as being really cutting edge. We were way ahead of, of most countries in, in vessel monitoring and in, in uh, observer coverage um, and constraints on the fishery, whether it be hooks, type, or something. So there's a lot going on and not a lot of time to, to educate people. Right. So, okay. So what can people do? To, if they don't support this expansion of this monument. And actually, I, I, I have to say that I'm kind of offended that they use the word monument, mm. you know, because who's against a monument, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone wants to support a monument, but, you know, that, that hurts our fishermen. And I, for one, I love my sashimi and my poke, and I don't want it to be coming from a foreign fishing boat and be charged $35 for my poke bowl. I think, that, <laughs> you know, I think like that, 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 you know, that really the initiative I think is, is primarily supported by um, large environmental organizations based on the mainland who, who have a, an objective of closing certain amounts of, of ocean to, um, to protect it in their, in their um, vision of the way management should be done. And, and, um, through the public process, you're required to use best available science, and, and Dave could speak about that. Um, but this isn't a public process because the mm -hmm. Antiquities Act allows the president to, to do what he wants to do without a public process. And to me, it's hard for me to understand why a group um, of locally based um, people would rather give their, um, their operational authority to Washington, D.C. with no public process rather than have a public process that requires the use of best available science. And, you know, so, so people have different uh, Agreed. agendas. Agreed. Uh, what can people do yes. to get involved? Well, um, <laughs> I, I think that they're, 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 we've, we've been told that there will be public hearings um, um, by representatives from, from the current uh, uh, administration, from the Obama administration. Um, opportunities for people to weigh in, certainly um, weighing in through, through other um, 
media events, a uh, letter to the editor or something like that, um, or, or just weighing in directly with, with uh, the administration and saying, we're not sure that this is the best thing for, for uh, the people of the state of Hawaii and, and for the U.S. citizen as they, well. They can certainly contact their local representatives. Mm. They're all aware of this issue. Um, there are many um, that support these views that expansion is not necessary. You know, it's a difficult process because uh, people ha really do have to understand that monument designation means um, there is no input. It's an executive order. Um, and people want to help wildlife, they want to help things sustainably, et cetera, but they also have to realize that, that this is just a political decision and it's not really scientifically supportable. Mm. And we're not against um, preserve being, we, you know, fishermen are by nature wanting sustainability because that's their living. Right. Certainly. Because if you overfish, and, what is there yeah. for tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. So even once um, to, to be good to the environment, but when it's being put forth to the public who doesn't really understand that, oh, expansion will save the animals, they could say, oh, okay, that's good. That sounds good. But they really have to look a little deeper and then contact their representatives to say, well, this isn't really necessary. It's just another uh, federalism of our local waters. That's right. Actually, I understand there was a letter from uh, Senate President Ron Kochi to mm -hmm. President Obama, as well as a letter from the House, I think 35, 36 There's representatives number signed, on to signed that. it. So, yeah, people at home, if you don't want our local fishermen to be hurt by this mon mm -hmm. monument expansion, um, get in touch with your local representatives and make your voice heard. I do think that one other thing that's important is that, that the initiative to close off large sections of ocean is, is a national or international initiative um, by a mainland-based organization. They're, they're doing similar type activities in uh, French Polynesia, for example, large areas of, of closed areas, and as well as, as, well as uh, New Zealand. And, and in, to recognize the problem here is that some 28% of, of our Sorry, waters are closed. Um, to U.S. fishermen already, so okay. um, so <laughs> we're carrying we're carrying a pretty fair burden when the next state has nine percent closed. So the state of Hawaii has twenty eight percent closed. Next state has something like nine percent closed to to that extractive uses. Seems an uses. unfair burden. It seems like we yes. seems like we've mm. contributed. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, and thank you. Uh, hope to hear more from you. Soon. I mean, thank thank you, Stacy. We appreciate discussion. the opportunity you, to, to have those have those discussions. I think it's.